the Caldor Center for giving me this opportunity to participate in a meeting on the two global compacts, a subject dear to my heart. But you know, I was here, happened to be here four years ago, when there were just the beginnings of discussions about forming a Calder Center. And I have to tell you, it is truly impressive how far you have come in the past four years, from being just an idea under discussion to having become a world-class, internationally renowned center of excellence in terms of research and social media and events and the issues that you address. You know, this doesn't happen automatically, so it takes a lot of hard work, so hats off to the callers, to Jane, to the wonderful team that, that Guy described. You've done fantastic work, and it's greatly appreciated, particularly at this moment in time, when we need the evidence and the discussion and the research and the conferences to dig deeper into what are very complex undertakings. So hats off to all of you. So I'm going to talk about the two global compacts, the process, the politics, the problems, the pitfalls, the potential. You notice all the alliteration there carefully chosen. I'll start with the, the processes, which are a bit more straightforward. Um, some of you may have followed the, the process and know all of this, so apologies if I'm repeating it. But in September 2016, the General Assembly adopted unanimously 193 countries the New York Declaration. Embedded in that was a call to develop two new global compacts over the course of the next year. These are two different processes, two different compacts, and I'll be talking about some of the differences between them. It was adopted by acclamation. It was immediately criticized by many as not accomplishing anything, a failed opportunity, another set of abstract declarations. But the fact that it reaffirmed core principles was not a foregone conclusion when this process began in early 2016, given the toxic xenophobic climate that was characterized last year and again this year. The New York Declaration for the first time expresses the commitment of all UN member states to responsibility sharing. It says, quote, to address the needs of refugees and receiving states, we commit to a more equitable sharing of burden and responsibility for hosting and supporting the world's refugees while taking account of existing contributions and differing capacities and resources among states. In terms of follow-up, on the refugee side, UNHCR was asked to implement the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, which is intended as a more holistic response at different phases of displacement, including different sectors of national, international, local communities. And on the basis of that experience, UNHCR was asked to propose the adoption of a global compact on refugees in UNHCR's annual report to the General Assembly in 2018. So that's on the refugee side. Now on the migration side, the New York De Declaration expresses a commitment to strengthening global governance of migration. But while UNHCR was entrusted with the process of developing this global compact and proposing it, on the migration side, it's much more complicated. There are many more actors involved in migration at the UN and outside of the UN. The Global Migration Group at the UN is made up of uh, UN agencies and other international organizations working on migration. There are 22 members of the Global Migration Group, all of whom have an interest in what goes into this global compact on migration. While UNHCR is in charge of um, formulating the Global Compact on Refugees. For the Global Compact on Migration, Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, responsibility was given to the President of the General Assembly, who named two co-facilitators, Switzerland and Mexico, to oversee the process, the negotiations of coming up with this Global Compact on, on Migration. While the Global Compact on Refugees will be included in UNHCR's report to the General Assembly, the process for adopting the Global Compact on Migration is to go to an international conference, an intergovernmental conference, to be held in Morocco in December. And so we've got 
In addition, we had a special representative of the Secretary General, Louise Arbor, who's been working since March to help support the process of developing a global compact on migration. So there are two very different processes. And moreover, the uh, consultations that UNHCR will have with governments on the global compact will take place in Geneva. Now, traditionally, Geneva, the diplomatic missions there are kind of a repository of expertise on both migration and refugees. So that's the environment that those discussions will take place. The discussions and negotiations on migration will take place in New York, where traditionally the diplomatic missions don't have much expertise in migration and refugees. They focus on peace, security, development, so you've got the two processes being negotiated in two different places by different diplomats that will cause problems or challenges, we can say, for both migration and refugees to make that transatlantic connection. It will also be very important for member states, for governments, to ensure smooth communication, not always the case, but to ensure smooth communication between capitals their representatives in Geneva, as well as their representatives in, in New York. So in, in looking at global governance, looking at these two processes, both are state-led, as you in jargon for uh, being determined by governments, they have different underpinnings in international law, different institutional actors, different diplomats in the league, different venues for negotiation, different timelines for the final adoption, and different expectations about the process and the outcome. Moreover, and this we've seen this year and we'll see in the next six months, a brutal pace of meetings, preparatory meetings. On the refugee side, we've had five thematic meetings this fall on particular issues. There'll be a stop taking exercise and high commissioner's dialogue in mid-December. UNHCR will then produce a zero draft of the Refugee Compact by February, followed by six two-day consultations with governments in Geneva, producing the final version by July, so that it can be translated in all the languages and then presented to the um, General Assembly in the fall, fall 2018. In addition to all of those meetings, the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework which is being piloted in 13 countries, has had dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings in the countries, around the countries, regional organizations have organized meetings, and so on. On the migration side, there is a parallel and equally brutal pace of meetings. There have been thematic meetings, regional meetings, stakeholder consultations, stop-taking meetings, in addition, two meetings of IOM's International Dialogue on Migration have focused on key elements of the Compact on Migration. There'll be a stock-taking meeting in Mexico uh, next week, um, preceded by a civil society meeting, followed by a multi-stakeholder meeting. There is a 10-page color-coded spreadsheet listing all of the meetings leading up to this process. In addition, both IOM and UNHCR regularly brief member states on what's going on. I can tell you there is a volume of paper that has been produced in this process. You know, government submissions and interventions, NGOs, academics, a whole host of, of paper has been produced. Um, there's no shortage of meetings and paper. But if you leave aside for a moment the global compacts, I mean, this represents a tremendous outpouring of energy, of ideas, of creativity. I'm sometimes dismayed that some of these initiatives don't build on one another. I mean, here's my proposal for responsibility. Sharing. Well, here's my proposal. And couldn't we have someone say, well, I like this element of this one, and let's put this element from this one together and kind of build on each other. But that so far hasn't been the process. But there are synergies uh, that you see on the websites and, uh, and in the midst of all these papers. Uh, UNHCR has suggested an academic advisory group on refugees. IOM has already set up a migration research leader syndicate. An impressive amount of work has been done. Even if the two compacts were to sink into the sea, and I don't think they will, I think we're going to get positive outcomes, there are already plenty of good ideas 
that can be taken up for those working with refugees and migrants both to use to improve our system. Okay, so that's a little bit about the processes, which are complex, but go to the websites and you'll see just a fantastic array of interventions, particularly if you like reading some of these reports. Um, let me step back a little bit and focus on a few key issues that seem to run through these. First, managing expectations. Um, the politics of negotiating these two global compacts at a time when we're still living in a time of great xenophobia and toxic narrative about both refugees and migrants are, are hard. These two compacts will be adopted by states. They will be determined by states' interests in negotiations. And this is frustrating to academics like me who would like to see bold, revolutionary change. But there are so many advantages to working with states and getting something approved by states, even if it falls short of some of our expectations of what a bold and ambitious program would be. We've seen, for example, with the World Humanitarian Summit, which was not a state-led process, that states you know, not accepting the findings or feeling any commitment to follow up the many recommendations that were made in that mammoth undertaking. Um, we know that states in recent years have shown little interest in taking on new obligations. Anything that reeks of commitments, conventions, legally binding, um, seems to be off, off record. Well, I wish I could stand here and tell you that it's likely that the two global compacts would be full of specific targets and measurable outcomes. I think this is very unlikely, given the difficult context we're living in. At the same time, there seems to be a realization that this is an unprecedented opportunity on both the refugee and the migration side to move our systems further. Um, IOM Director Bill Swing sometimes uses the language of this is a rendezvous with history. But he, I think we can say it's unlikely that we're going to have this opportunity again in our lifetimes. It's the first time 30 years I've been working with refugees that we've seen this level of high-level political interest, this opportunity to shape the future system, to make it more responsive, to address some of the inequities in it. So there are opportunities coupled with this issue of knowing that through a state-led process, the results are probably not going to be um, as concrete and binding as many of us would wish. So another main theme that occurred to me is, what is a compact? Where did this word come from? Why is the term suddenly in vogue? If you go to law dictionaries, you see, I'm not a lawyer, but if you go to law dictionaries and you see a, a compact is an agreement or a contract. In the past several years, we've seen the word compact used in international gatherings, most recently in the UN's Global Compact which is a strategic initiative to support the private sector in terms of their responsible business practices. Last year, 2016, compacts on refugees were developed in Jordan and Lebanon. And those compacts were essentially deals. And the explicit deal was international community will give money to Jordan and, and uh, Lebanon in exchange for making life easier for Syrian refugees. And the implicit understanding was that by doing so, fewer Syrians would make the trek to Europe. So these were political agreements, if you will, for those two countries. The global compacts on migration and refugees are different from both of those. They're going to be agreements rather than treaties, non-binding rather than legal instruments. Um, the Raoul um, Wallenberg Institute came up with a very interesting collection of essays on the meaning of compact, just published last month, and, and notes that the term compact occupies a peculiar space in international relations, somewhere between politics and law. It sounds a, sort of legal sounding, a compact, but it will be a political agreement. On the other hand, we have lots of examples of this soft law leading eventually to hard law or customary law, so I don't think we should be dismayed by the fact that these are likely to be non-binding. They can be stepping stones to, to further work. Another question, why do we have two compacts instead of one? Although, although the idea of a single 
Global Compact on Human Mobility was discussed briefly in the initial weeks of preparation for the New York Summit. Almost immediately, the significant differences between the international migration and refugee regimes led to a decision to have two separate approaches. The fact that there are two compacts and not one seems to solidify the binary distinction between refugees and migrants versus those who would see this as more of a continuum. Interestingly, more than a third of the commitments in the New York Declaration apply to both refugees and migrants, but nobody is talking about those. I mean, there are lots of issues where both refugees and migrants face xenophobia, for example, or difficulties in integration, or problems at the border, or unaccompanied kids. There are a whole host of areas where there is overlap, but all attention is focused on these two compacts. And not to go into a whole lecture on different regimes, but the refugee and the migration regimes are so different. The refugee regime, you've got an accepted definition, maybe imperfect, but an accepted common definition. You've got an international convention that's been ratified by 140 plus countries of the world. You've got a single UN agency charged with it. And it's a very straightforward, we were aware of the problems, but in terms of global governance, it's pretty straightforward. The refugee regime is not only UN-centric, it's UNHCR-centric. Everybody working on refugees somehow relates to UNHCR. I can't think of a major process on refugees where UNHCR hasn't been there. Now, on the migration side, it's a whole different ballgame. There is no convention. There's a convention on migrant workers in 1990, but it hasn't been ratified by any large migrant receiving country. There's a lot of human rights law that's used and certainly is applicable, but there isn't this bedrock of one single convention that all people working on migration can use. Moreover, there is not a single definition of what is a migrant. Within the UN, there are at least four different definitions. IOM has one, OHCHR has one, um, UN uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, International Labor Organization, and people love their definitions. And they kind of cling to them. You know, some of these definitions, such as DESA's, says you know, migrants are people who've been in a country for a year. That excludes everybody in transit, right? And so there, there's not a common definition, there's not a common um, legal regime. And then you've got lots of different organizations. You have IOM, the International Organization for Migration, which is the only UN, now UN related agency with migration as its exclusive focus. But you know, IOM was created outside of the UN and for more than 60 years. You know, function is a very different entity. Its mandate does not include protection or solutions or development of international law and guidelines, normative frameworks, and so forth. Moreover, while the refugee regime is centered around UNHCR, the migration regime has a lot of non-UN actors and, and processes. The Global Forum on Migration and Development was initiated outside of the UN because the fear was that migration was too contentious to take up within the, within the UN. You've got regional processes. Even within the UN, you've got a UN um, Special Representative of the Secretary General on International Migration and Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants Reporting the Human. You've got so many different different actors. Um, there's another fundamental difference between migration and refugees that you see a lot on the academic side. And this is the difference in conceptualizing the relationship between migration and refugees. Those who are migration specialists see, sorry, see migration as the overarching category. And within migration, you've got voluntary and involuntary migrants. Involuntary or forced migrants include refugees, but can include others as well. So migration advocates are always seeing refugees as part of migrants. And this is reflected, frankly, in a lot of IOM's work in terms of uh, publicizing the work it does. A lot of the people they put on their website as, I am a migrant, would seem to be refugees fleeing persecution, conflict, and violence, and so on. Um, refugee advocates tend to see refugees as a distinct group. 
It isn't a subcategory of larger migration. In, in fact, that refugees are distinct because they don't enjoy the, inter the protection of their governments and need international protection. And a feeling that any blurring of that line between refugees and migrants could lead to a weakening of the whole refugee regime. And we've seen that even the regime as it is in the definition, you know, more and more governments are eroding basic principles of refugee protection. If you start making the case that there are others who aren't refugees, but who need protection, so let's expand these, you could put at risk the whole concept of, of protection of the refugees. So I think the decision to call for two compacts rather than one has indicated a clear choice. And the choice is that refugees are not a subset of migrants, that they have particular needs, issues that need to be um, dealt with separately. You know, on the one hand, this may represent a lost opportunity to look at some of those gray areas and to look at areas where migrants and refugees face common problems. On the other hand, it may help with some of the institutional conflicts between organizations to make it clear that refugees and migrants are, are separate. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, well, I guess you're all grown-ups there, there are institutional turf battles within the international system. UNHCR and IOM have different mandates, different governing bodies, different institutional cultures, different jargon. Um, it isn't so simple to say that UNHCR works with refugees and IOM with migrants, because IOM has been working in refugee resettlement since the very beginning, and more recently has developed large-scale programs to work with internally displaced persons. Relations between UNHCR and IOM have had their ups and downs over the years, and sometimes there's very good cooperation in the field. But I think we're going through a particularly bad patch right now. We've seen the turf concerns in, in Bangladesh, for example. Um, the process of negotiating these two separate compacts, you know, what's to be included in which seems to be bringing out more and more rivalry. <coughs> The situation is further complicated by the fact that IOM became a related agency of the UN in the past year, not a specialized agency like UNHCR, but a weaker um, relationship. In anticipation of this, many human rights groups hoped that by becoming more formally a part of the UN, that IOM would adopt more human rights frameworks, more standards, would follow practices as other agencies um, are compelled to do. And that some of their programs, like running detention centers in Indonesia and Libya, might come under increased scrutiny. Or maybe, perhaps, IOM would decide that as a UN agency that they could no longer perform this function on behalf of certain governments. So far, there's little evidence that IOM is moving in this direction. Um, current Director General Bill Sweeney has emphasized over and over again that IOM is not going to change its ways of working because of its new formal relationship with the UN. I hope that, he, that IOM reconsiders this and begins to think strategically because there are a lot of advantages for IOM of becoming a full functioning, compliant uh, UN agency. And I think that there are advantages as well for the UN. Let me just say a few words about the relationship between these two processes. Very distinct processes going on in parallel with all these meetings. Um, but, but the fate of the two are intertwined as much as parties on both sides would like to keep them separate. In the summer of 2016, there were governmental negotiations, um, which eventually led to the New York Declaration, seemed poised to accept the Global Compact on Responsibility Sharing for Refugees, and to set in motion a process for developing a Global Compact on Migration. This was the expectation really in, in June of last year, that the, the General Assembly would go ahead and adopt the Global Compact on Responsibility Sharing for Refugees. And then in the interest of parity would set up a process for coming up with a Global Compact on Migration. And David Donahue, who was a co-facilitator of this process, can, I'm sure, tell us lots of stories about what was happening behind the scenes. But on the 30th of June, the co-facilitators circulated a text on the Global um, Compact on Responsibility Sharing. 
In a couple weeks later, it became a global compact on refugees. Responsibility sharing was dropped. And by the end of the month, there was a decision to postpone the adoption of a global compact on refugees. So to, until 2018. And certainly what we heard was a lot of migration advocates were afraid that if we went ahead and did something on refugees, they would never get around to migration. And yet both issues were important and deserved equal treatment. So in a sense, the Global Compact on Refugees was held hostage to the Global Compact on Migration. And I think that there's a bit of fear that something similar could happen in the, in the coming year. If the Global Compact on Migration runs into big problems, how would that affect it? what should be a straightforward adoption of a UNHCR report to the General Assembly, but it's, it's something to, to watch out for. The issue of complementarity between them, there have been a few meetings in Geneva between those working on the Global Compacts on Migration and Refugees, but those discussions have been difficult. You know, that, again, given the very different context between them, it seems likely that the Global Compact on Refugees will have a comprehensive plan of action, a more operational part on how to implement this comprehensive refugee response and framework. It seems likely that the Global Compact on Migration will be more general principles, abstract, global governance. It'll be the first time the General Assembly would have adopted something like this. Um, let me talk a little bit about some of the dangers that lie ahead. There are different pitfalls, I think, for both Compacts. And since the negotiations or consultations with governments haven't yet start, started, all of this is, is speculative. But I think there's a feeling that the main danger for the Global Compact on Refugees is that it will simply reaffirm the comprehensive refugee response framework. And a lot of the principles and ideas of that are already taking place. The Engagement of Development Actors, the World Bank's commitment, the planning that's going on at the country level in these pilot countries is already uh, going, going well. There's some very creative work going on. I think it's going to be very important to look at the term responsibility sharing. We hope that it will be included in the preambular language on the Global Compact on Refugees. But having sat through some of the negotiations, a lot of governments really don't like the term responsibility sharing. And some prefer burden sharing, particularly host countries. But a lot of governments don't like responsibility sharing because implicit in that is a little bit of obligation of states. If we commit to responsibility sharing, what does that mean when a given situation occurs? Um, so how it will be portrayed, will it be just a general affirmation? I think it's unlikely there will be a concrete mechanism in the Global Compact on Responsibility Sharing, but perhaps something to move it further from just a commitment would be helpful. There are more pitfalls in terms of negotiating a Global Compact on Migration, starting with the fundamental tension between those concerned with border management and control, and human rights of migrants. Both are likely to be in the compact, but the balance between them will be very interesting to watch. Another pitfall for the Global Compact on Migration is the sheer number of issues to be included. Annex 2 of the New York Declaration lists 26 issues. And the danger for the Global Compact on Migration is that it will affirm the easy generalities and bypass, skip, <coughs> postpone the contentious issues. It's very easy to say, for example, um, more orderly, safe, regular migration is good. It's more difficult for governments to say, and, and we'll help by opening up new pathways. And that's very unlikely to happen. So, you know, contentious issues uh, such as detention of children or how unaccompanied children are, are, are treated you may, may cause problems in the whole process or could simply be postponed. There's a possibility for more north-south tension to develop in these negotiations. An undercurrent in both compacts is this relationship between terrorism and migration, securitization that got, I mentioned a, a little while ago, and it's kind of running below the surface of this. Um, I'll just mention that um, a wild card in this whole process is the Trump administration. So far, the U.S. has played a constructive role, we're told, in the discussions around both global compacts. It's unclear, frankly, um, where um, 
where the political support for that is coming from? Is it coming out of the State Department or USAID or the UN mission in New York? Or is it coming from some of Trump's closest advisors? I think many refugee and migration advocates kind of hope the Trump folks haven't noticed that this is going on. It might have a little more leeway and freedom to negotiate. And watch out for the issue of vulnerable migrants or migrants in vulnerable situations. This has always been a pesky issue. And there are real problems even defining what is vulnerable. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights says, accurately, that all migrants in irregular situations are vulnerable. That is true. But that isn't very helpful for policy <coughs> to develop some way of dealing with particularly vulnerable migrants. The sheer number of terms we've got, forced migrants, vulnerable migrants, crisis migrants, survival migrants, environmental migrants, all indicate that there are people who may be forced to move who don't meet the definition of a refugee, but may require special treatment or protection. The New York Declaration called for a state-led process to come up with guidelines on this. It's, no government's taken this up yet. It's too politically sensitive or too busy going to all of these meetings on the global compacts to do that. But you know, how, how will this group be dealt with? Um, well, probably will come in the global compact on migration, but there should be some complementarity, particularly on issues like environmental displacement that are likely to become bigger issues in the future, should be. We know where our IDPs. The issue of internally displaced persons is not yet on the agenda of either global compact. Last week, I understand in thematic discussions, there was an agreement to take IDPs into the comprehensive refugee response framework, but we don't know how that will play out. This was a, a problem as well in the um, New York negotiations, which came up with the New York Declaration. The feeling of, with IDPs, you know, they're twice the number of IDPs as there are refugees in the world. Often they're more vulnerable and at risk than refugees. I mean, would you rather be an IDP in Aleppo or a refugee in Turkey? You know, both bad options, but certainly IDPs have very clear protection and assistance needs that, that aren't being addressed right now by the international, international system. But issues of state sovereignty, issues of not knowing how to move forward um, with the issue in terms of institutional development you know, make it difficult to come up with answers. And yet on both, yet for both ILM and UNHCR, both agencies are deeply involved with IEPs. Um, UNHCR, I mean, Guy has even suggested that UNHCR's mandate be changed to formally include IEPs in recognition of the close relationship. Meanwhile, ILM is running major operations on IEPs. Their displacement tracking matrix, which is a a, a data system for counting IDPs and employs over 2,500 people. And this is a major commitment they've made. They've got a new framework on IDPs. I mean, it kind of, as we think about what's going to happen with IDPs as these two global compacts are being negotiated, we kind of see both agencies thinking, you know, how do we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis IDPs in the future? Something to watch. So, I mean, I've talked about pitfalls and danger, but let me, let me just say a few words about potential so we don't end on a terribly negative note. Um, while the global compacts are likely to consist of general non-binding principles, there are lots of ways that they can signal uh, or prepare for future more detailed work on the issues. Don't underestimate the importance of just having a principle, a sentence, half a sentence in a document that's been approved by the General Assembly for carrying forward work. I used to work with uh, IDPs for, for 10 years, and we would over and over again refer to half a phrase in the 2005 World Summit document where you know, guiding principles on internal displacement are recognized as an important institutional framework. I can't tell you how many times we use that to show the legitimacy of the guiding principles, which were developed by an expert group and were in fact presented to, but not adopted by anybody at the UN. But we had that little phrase that we could use. So those little phrases can be important for carrying forward work. And I hope that both global compacts, by acknowledging key issues, maybe mechanisms for follow-up, can enable us to get to the concrete commitments that, that are needed. And I think on the refugee side, the main challenges are to how to hold governments accountable for 
for displacing people, for the way they treat refugees, asylum seekers? Um, is there a way for the Global Compact on Refugees to signal the need for more accountability mechanisms, even if they can't include them in the Global Compact? A you know, way to open the door for further work on this? Similarly, there's a need, burning need, for responsibility sharing for refugees. You know, the, the term common but differentiated responsibility has been helpful in the climate change um, context. Maybe something like that could be used to assuage governments that they're not going to be asked to take on major new obligations while opening the door to coming up with systems, mechanisms, targets for responsibility sharing. Um, on the migration side, I think it would be a major step forward if there was some simplification of the many actors working on the migration side. I mean, I would like to see IOM make a commitment and its member states to changing its constitution to include much more human rights focus, much more protection focus, and then to see IOM play a leadership role on the migration side and not have all these different um, turf battles on the migration side between these 22 international agencies. I think it's time to think about migration as collective responsibility. We, there seems to be an understanding that there's a collective responsibility for refugees. It's in the collective public good that refugees are protected and assisted. It's in the global public good for migration to be effectively, responsibly, predictably managed. It's in everybody's interest to come up with a system that's more effective and predictable. On the migration side especially, states and civil society organizations are devoting a lot of attention to follow-up mechanisms, review mechanisms. How will, how will this be monitored? That offers possibility for dealing with some of the contentious issues that are unlikely to surface in the, in the compact itself. Clearly, IDPs need more attention. Um, you know, I wonder if maybe this time next year we're going to have a meeting on a global compact on IDPs. Just an idea. Oh. I mean, I think that um, we still need to make progress on this issue of people who are crossing international borders who aren't refugees but need, need more attention. There's been already work that has been done on this. Could the uh, Compact on Migration signal a way forward to use some of this work to consult with states, for example? Finally, both global compacts could challenge regional organizations to do much more. I mean, sometimes we see all these processes at the global level, and while there are possibilities for doing more and more concretely at the regional level, the EU's relocation scheme hasn't been a shining example of how that might work, but, but there are possibilities in regions. I, I thought the statement that came out of the San Pedro Sula meeting in, in, in Honduras um, last month, two months ago, um, was very positive. I mean, it included IDPs and refugees and different levels of governments were making commitments. There, there seemed to be some energy there, which perhaps we should focus more on regional projects. So in some of these processes are complicated, lots of pitfalls, lots of politics, lots of problems. But we do have a chance. <clears throat> we do have a chance this year to push the systems a little bit further down the road of protection and human rights and making sure that all of those who travel um, receive the attention and response that, that they need. Um, by doing so, we strengthen our multilateral systems of government. You know, if the UN fails at these two compacts, the UN suffers. It's a test of multilateralism, not just our specific issues of migrants and refugees. So there's a lot at stake, and I believe we have a lot more to do. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Beth, for that really comprehensive overview of the, the process, the pitfalls, the potential, and so on. I just wondered what role you see for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in addressing some of those uh, things that have fallen between the, the two compacts. Because obviously they have, uh, in, in their mandate, a very firm legal underpinning in the work that they do. But how strong do you see the office in terms of being an institutional actor in this area? And how do you see it positioning itself here? Yeah, the OHCHR, on behalf of the Global Migration Group, has already developed recommendations for dealing with this category of people. I think the recommendations are good. What they don't have is state buy-in. I mean, states like to negotiate things themselves and own it. You know, but if there could be a process to take some of the work that's already been done, I think OHCHR would be well positioned to be in the lead and enter into a process of talking with states about how we make these into the concrete, um, practical, actionable items. I think that would be a good thing for me. Another question is from Caroline. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, for that very interesting presentation on from Jesuit Refugee Service. Um, so I just want to, to go, uh, explore further this issue of the nexus or complementarity between the two compacts. And I want to talk specifically about some of the populations that could fall out. And you spoke about IDPs, but I want to explore further the issue of asylum seekers and the issue of people that cannot be returned to their countries, stateless people as well. Um, and also to, to mention something specific about this Asia Pacific region and the fact that actually by so many countries not being signatories to the refugee convention, um, the sort of populations that we have here that are refugees and asylum seekers are, are, are quite highly affected by the migration compact, uh, which is really very much about, uh, it's about border control and it's about managed migration. Um, and finally, just to ask you, from Luis Arbor's initial proposals now to create an alternative mechanism in terms of some sort of humanitarian protection for those populations that are falling in the middle. middle. What do you think about that? Because that's, I mean, she's starting to speak about almost going to a third country for, for those populations, but resettlement is not even working. Uh, so how do you see that progressing further um, in terms of, of those initial proposals? Thank you. And I think the whole issue of humanitarian protection should get a lot more attention, a lot more discussion in terms of how that might work in, in practice. But you also mentioned this issue of return, and I think it's going to end up being one of the most contentious parts of the global compact on migration. You know, to have an effective, predictable migration system, you need some way of returning people who aren't allowed to enter. And yet, too often that's used in, to violate rights of people and the processes themselves aren't, aren't fair and predictable. So that whole issue of how returns are dealt with, I think will be a subject of a lot of negotiation with government. And it'll be an indication when you look at the drafts of the Global Compact on Migration of this balance between border control people and human rights people and see the way in which that's depicted. Uh. <coughs> Thank you, and the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Committee on the Rights of Migrant Workers recently came out with their joint general comments on the rights of children in the context of migration, which I imagine are very timely for the global compacts. And I was particularly struck by the language in one of the comments on immigration detention of children and how strong that language was. This might be a bit optimistic, but what do you think are our chances of seeing similar kinds of language in the global compacts? You know, the issue of detention of children, and David may, may correct me, I think it was the most contentious issue in the whole negotiation of the New York Declaration. Frankly, it, it was painful to hear uh, gymnastics of governments using the language. Um, the original formulation said children shall not be detained and, under any circumstances for purposes of immigration or, or something. And the final language said, you know, unless absolutely necessary, until we work out alternatives, in accord with national law, I means a terrible convoluted sentence that represented these different interests. I mean, I would hope that the Global Compact on Migration, possibly on refugees,
liturgies as well, include something that's strong and clear and, and well-written um, sentence on the attention of children. You know, it's still shocking to me that this is controversial, but, but it is indeed. Next question? Here. Oh, Hi, good morning. Excellent presentation and very, very interesting. Um, my, my question is, you know, how international agreements that are legally binding are not really successful sometimes. How countries, uh, I don't want to use a very, um, this, this word, but I'm just going to use it, pretend to comply with the international agreement. If this if these international compacts, if these global compacts are not legally binding, do you think they will really make their job? I mean, just comparing to the other ones that are legally binding and they're not complied to, what would be the, the outcome for this one? Yeah, I think you, you hit a very important issue, and that's the whole implementation or compliance. As, as you mentioned, as you discussed yesterday, compliance with existing treaties is, is certainly not is inadequate. Um, but I'm, I'm modestly hopeful that there will be things in or around these compacts that will move us forward. For example, there are efforts underway now to develop a refugee response index to rate countries on how well they're doing with refugees, not just in terms of resettlement numbers and financing, but in terms of policies for asylum seekers. You know, those kind of maybe independent monitoring bodies that are keeping track and calling out and drawing attention to it could be helpful. This whole issue of accountability, how do you hold governments accountable? You know, Phil Orchard and I were talking before, I mean, how do you hold Australia accountable for what's happening with its treatment of asylum seekers? You know, you do economic sanctions, UN Human Rights Committee has already said strong things, they <coughs> are continually saying strong things. I mean, how, well, where is accountability in our system? If it isn't there for Australia, where is it for Myanmar and Bangladesh? And, and I think we need to address these questions of accountability, which you know, related to questions of compliance, but you know, these compacts certainly aren't going to be a panacea and co coerce or force governments to take actions they wouldn't otherwise have taken. But maybe they can move a step or two in that direction. Hi. Um, just building on the uh, earlier question about the joint general comment, um, I wondered if you could comment on how much traction um, you've seen in efforts to use other normative frameworks like the Child Rights Convention and um, you know, bringing a gender lens to the compacts, how much traction those efforts are getting um, and whether you see them as a, uh, a, a good initiative or a distraction from um, building uh, principles in, into the compacts. I think especially on the migration side that those, the Commission on the Rights of the Child and other human rights um, instruments are vitally important. That's their anchor, if you will. On the refugee side, you have the Refugee Convention. So, well, I expect to see it there as well. I don't think it'll be as, as strong. My sense is there's been a lot more attention to children than there has been to gender in the discussions about these compacts. I don't know if it's because of the unaccompanied kids arriving on U.S.-Mexico border or crossing the Mediterranean, but there seems to be more energy around that. Or maybe it's the particular agencies that are working on these issues that have done a good job of raising children's issues. I don't see gender really mainstream in these contexts, but I know I'll get answers to that later this morning on how that could be incorporated. Um, I don't think that's because of bad will. I think it's people just aren't are thinking about so many other things that gender isn't at the top of their list as is often the case. Paul? Yeah, uh, Paul Powell from Refugee Council of Australia. Yeah, Paul Powell from Refugee Council of Australia. I want uh, to ask you um, what your feeling at the moment is about whether or not these compacts are going to affect any significant change, um, and in what way. And also, given that um, the compacts are still being negotiated, what opportunities are there civil society organisations to um, push for change which is actually going to make a difference to other people. Yeah. 
I think that both global compacts will make a difference for refugees and migrants. Some of the changes we've already seen with this comprehensive refugee response framework are very positive. I mean, it's good when you have more coordinated, holistic approaches, and at least there's lip service paid to participation of refugees in these processes. It's hard to see how that will be concretized, but I think that they will move us forward. On the migration side, this is a monumental opportunity to make a beginning in developing a coherent global migration governance system. We're not going to get there with you know, all the bells and whistles, but that first step in the direction is going to be an anchor, I think, for coming years to build up migration law to, um, to be more comprehensive and coherent. So yes, I think they, they will make a difference. But I, you know, I'm a big believer in civil society and some of the contributions that have come from NGOs. And I think that you're more effective when you work together when three or four organizations say these are the three things to include. You know, my advice is shorter is better than longer. I'm an academic and I love 50 page papers with lots of footnotes. But if you want to influence policy, you need three bullet points. You know, and so you know, figuring out a way to get your three bullet points from your 50 page paper, I think is probably the, the best way to influence. Do we have any, any further questions? Up the back. You might make uh, just the last question for the team. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, given your very prescient comment that if the UN fails, the UN suffers, I'm curious if you might want to illuminate the reasons for which IOM has entered the fold. Or, or the reason for which the UN has been happy to have IOM enter the fold a little bit more strongly. You know, IOM has worked according to various UN rules for, for years. You know, their leave system, their hiring, their salaries, their, a lot of them are really following UN standards. Um, I think it was seen by the UN as a concrete, tangible outcome of the global summit in this whole process. It was something clear to bring IOM into the UN family. It was a, concrete achievement. There were some changes on IOM's side. You know, for years, IOM you know, liked the freedom and the flexibility of working in its own way. IOM developed a very different culture than UNHCR and other organizations. It's you know, very dependent on project-specific funding. It's, I think it can act very rapidly. It's agile. It moves quickly. Um, less bound by the normative frameworks, um, more by you know, getting things done. They have a good reputation in terms of setting things up quickly. But isn't there some way to use those strengths within the UN system and maybe to challenge UN agencies that aren't so agile and quick? And uh, Anyway, I think that there are some real benefits to it, but I think there has to be change on IOM side as well as on the UN side for this really to be a big step forward. Ladies and gentlemen, can we just give Professor Ferris a... Uh,